Hello and welcome everyone to our next episode of Language Matters uh, Indigenous Voices series. And today we're very grateful to have a very, very distinguished uh, guest, Jonathan Levy, who is the industry veteran and uh, a founding commissioner of uh, Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreting. Uh, he's an assistant director of the University of Arizona National Center for Interpretation. And he's worked with many government organizations like FEMA, Defense Language Institute, um, Foreign Language Center, and, and many, many others. So my, my first question is, uh, Jonathan, what are your um, indigenous roots? Uh, tell, uh, you know, um, what, so what, where do you, what, what is, um, where's your home in a way? So where my home is right now is Tucson, Arizona. I was born in Flagstaff, Arizona. My mother is Hopi Tewa and my father is Jewish. So I come from a very tribal background. Um, yeah, and they met uh, as a result of the project that I'm going to talk about today back in the 60s. So your father created uh, the very, very first training, right? Interpreter training? No, actually, he created uninterpreter training, a medical interpreter training in 1963. Mm -hmm. But as he says in the intro of his final report um, to the university that funded it, uh, there was actually this type of training had been developed in the 40s on the Navajo, on the Diné Nation, um, but it largely disappeared. So um, it's actually what he has done, uh, which is kind of striking, is one uh, example of just a continuous process uh, within America, interacting with indigenous peoples and trying to figure out ways to navigate, navigate the language culture barrier. I'll just leave it at oh, that. That's brilliant, brilliant. So tell us more about this project and tell us about this, this training. Okay, so um, I guess, uh, in a nutshell, um, my father was a cultural anthropologist, um, and as a young ethnographer back in the 60s, he was, he had been working on the Kiowa Nation uh, after his, uh, that was his first job after getting his PhD from the University of Chicago, and Cornell University and Berkeley had been tasked with researching and trying to figure out why there had been so many challenges on the Navajo Nation with improving healthcare. So um, Indian Health Service and the Bureau of Indian Health had developed these and created these massive bright shiny new hospitals uh, in the nation. And what they were finding is people weren't going to them. People weren't using them and they were unsure why. And so um, these two Cornell and Berkeley programs explored this and with limited success, one of the things that reasons they may be limited was they were relying primarily on, on white um, uh, workers from those organizations to go out and interact with the Navajos. Um, and so what they decided to do is they found out there was this young ethnographer, Gerald Levy, who was working with the Kiowa, and they thought, well, let's bring him in and see if he can figure out what's going on. Uh, and before we go further, I just do want to do a disclaimer. I've talked about this in a, this project and this in a few other contexts. I'm, I'm getting a little older, and as I was uh, raised um, using terms like Indian, white, Anglo, Navajo, as opposed to Diné and other terms that are more widely used today, when I talk about this project in the historical context, I usually use the original terms because it's difficult for my brain to switch back and forth just because and it's not as agile as it used to be. Um, and and what are the correct terms to use today? I think Diné. I mean, you, you know, when uh, people want to go back through uh, and speak about any indigenous population, you want to go back to the First Nations preferred name for itself. And uh, white people, as far as I can tell, are still comfortable with being called white. So uh, I just usually go with, go with those two terms. Um, but as it, I'm sure hopefully no one in the audience will be hopefully upset for any reason. And if so, I apologize. 
Um, the other thing I'd like to apologize is I get really excited about this stuff and I live on coffee, so I am over caffeinated. Um, so if I get too excited, I just start getting too into the weeds about any particular linguistic or cultural element, please just uh, interrupt me and ask me to dial it down. I'd be very comfortable doing that. Now, that'll be perfect. That'll be perfect. You, you and I both <laughs> love coffee, so here's my <laughs> coffee cup. Um, yeah, so this project, um, you know, 1963, he goes out and he starts observing, doing what ethnographers do. Um, looking at why uh, the Navajo were not using the uh, hospitals and why there was such a difficulty um, with communication. Um, one of the really interesting elements about this project is he, um, at that point, met a man, Dennis Parker, who would go on to be uh, his interpreter for the rest of his career and lifelong friend. Um, and Dennis Parker was a Navajo interpreter par excellence. He was one of the best. And there's, there was a reason for that. Um, and so I guess that, that's the project writ large. What the work they did was to observe, identify what the challenges were, work through potential solutions, which would require the creation of a medical, medical interpreter training program for the Navajo interpreters, and then implement it. And they did it uh, over the course of a couple of years, and they documented what worked and what didn't and why. And so in a nutshell, when I started working, I, you know, uh, I used to be the assistant director at the University of Arizona's National Center for Interpretation, uh, and my father was an anthropologist at the University of Arizona. And when I first said, oh, I'm working with interpretation, my father handed me this report. There were only two copies in existence, and they were hard copies. He's like, oh, this is the work that I did back in the 60s on that. Maybe you'll find it interesting. Long story short, it took me years and years to look at them um, for a variety of reasons when I handed them to other people to look at. Just things always came up. It took us a long time to digitalize the documents and, and get them into a format where we could potentially share them. So now we're at the point where we're hoping to describe what this program is about, potentially identify its value, and then just make it available out in the world. So that's kind of why I guess I'm here today to kind of put that out there. This is incredible on so many levels. You mentioned that there was a training created in, in the 40s, and of course we know, or at least uh, those of us who paid attention in school uh, are supposed to know about the, the Navajo uh, role during World War II and, and the Navajo uh, code, uh, uh, the code talkers in World War II who basically helped um, win, win the war in, in many ways. And uh, so you mentioned that there was something created in the 40s, but it didn't stay. And is there any other modern or any other training that's actually available today or that people can take? So the University of Arizona's National Center for Interpretation has been doing Navajo court and medical interpreter training since the 90s. And that was funded by both the New Mexico and Arizona state court systems. Um, I haven't looked at the programs recently, um, but I've stayed in contact with many of the faculty um, they, over the years, have produced a whole cadre of trained uh, interpreters. Um, the challenge has been, like everything else, for those interpreters to find work and keep engaged and stay connected because the Navajo Nation is the largest First Nation in the United States and um, the population is spread widely to, you know, the general challenges that we have. Um, so there is training that has been available since. Um, its current status I'd have to look at. I, I don't know if they lost. I think it's still funded. It's still going. Um, I don't know if it would make sense, but um, I've spoken on to this on this topic a couple times before. I could I could show uh, a slide deck with just some background information about. Oh, that the, would be wonderful. Training. 
just to give some context and some that images would be, that my would father be took at that time. And, and super interesting. All right. Are yes. you seeing a gentleman yes. on a Oh my board? goodness, yes. Hooray. Okay. Um, well, let me go ahead and just move through these hopefully fairly quickly. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the Navajo, it is the largest First Nation in the United States. And, um, and I apologize being a social studies teacher, uh, I can get carried away on this, but essentially it includes areas of four states, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. And um, it's roughly the size of Connecticut. So it's, it's a large place. Um, within the Navajo Nation is also uh, the, it encircles the Hopi Nation. Um, and also uh, there's been a lot of uh, interaction with the Pueblo, the Tewa people and Pueblo people of Northern New Mexico and Arizona. So it's a really rich, diverse, interesting location. Um, these are some photographs that my father took during his time working there that I'd like to put up just to give you a sense of what the land looked like in 1963. So what you see here is a hogan, which is the traditional um, dwelling of, of, of many Diné people. Um, as a child, I spent a lot of time uh, on Upper Monkopi, which is a, a Hopi village in the uh, in, in, in that area. Um, and my great grandfather uh, lived in a hogan, uh, Taluipi. And so I got to spend time in there with him when he was still alive. And this is much like it looked like when I was a kid in the 70s uh, up on the reservation. Um, so as you can see, there's horse, not a lot else out there right there, kind of scrub. Um, this was a picture that I was just, uh, I, I put in just because I found it very compelling. Um, this was an old, uh, 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 a man, I believe his name is Crooked Me, and I haven't, I, I haven't asked my mom, uh, who, but I'm pretty sure it's Crooked Me. He came up, my dad was working with a family, um, and he came up to see about, he had been talking to the, the, parents of the daughter, one of the daughters of the family that he had been, was interested in maybe um, essentially getting married to her. So that's why he was there at the house. And uh, this is a picture of one of the daughters of the um, family that my father was working with. And as you can see, um, she's wearing kind of traditional, her well, traditional Diné garb, Navajo clothing traditional hairstyle. So this just gives you an image of who we're talking about and where. This is a little more detailed uh, map of the area. And as I said, you can see, you know, it's very large spread, widespread. And there are within the Navajo Nation, the blue area here is the Hopi Nation. Tuba City is the largest population uh, center over on this side. Cayenta, Chinle, these are all areas, Shiprock, with large kind of population centers where they were trying to um, create improved health care by making either hospitals or better public health service outreach efforts to reach all the um, uh, the nation members who were spread out throughout this whole area. So a real challenge. Um, so I hope this is still coming through because I haven't heard anything else. And just really quickly, this is a picture of my dad. Um, like I said, here he's standing next to the uh, <laughs> Tom Mix Memorial in Southern Arizona. Uh, he was a, he was a good guy. I miss him very much. He was from New York City originally, and then decided to come out west. A um, couple other things. One other person I want to introduce here really quick. Um, this is Dennis Parker. So Dennis Parker was my father's interpreter for most of the time he worked on the on the Navajo, and he was an exceptional interpreter. And my father could have never done my work, his work without him. Um, and what made Dennis so exceptional was he was born into a traditionalist family, 
He was raised um, understanding the traditional mean ways of healthcare, uh, the sings, the ways, etc. But he got tuberculosis as a young man. And so he was sent down to Tucson, Arizona to be treated for TB in the sanatoriums that they had there in the 50s. And um, being an inquisitive, intelligent, energized young human, he wanted to learn everything he could. So not only did he master English at a significant level, he was constantly asking questions about medical technology, processes, procedures, everything he saw around him. So he was a unique individual who had both a knowledge of the language of both Navajo and English and an understanding of both the culture and the terminology for healthcare in both environments. So he was exceptional and he was the interpreter informant for my father to do his work. So without Dennis, this never would have worked. And credit to my father, he gave credit to, De to Dennis every part uh, along the entire process. Anytime he published anything, every, anytime he did anything, he made sure that Dennis was front and center in receiving credit for that work. Because my father understood without him, nothing would have happened. So um, just a quick picture, that's Dennis Parker, a couple other people. I just like this picture because it shows how amazingly awesome the Navajo were in the 60s. They look like rock stars. They're freaking cool, man. So I just I just like to put some of the human the humanness behind these these stories because these were these were uh, these were some really great people and they did some really interesting stuff. And so the last picture I'm going to show before we move on to get into the actual uh, report itself was um, and I apologize. This is from uh, uh, a presentation I did to the uh, Translator Association a, a few years ago. This is my dad and my mom. He's no longer with us. I miss him very much. My mom, she's still with us. Just I'll see her later tonight. Um, uh, very nice people. I'm glad they came together into the project. And this is just my mom explaining to me who these people were, what it meant, and why it was important. So that's just a little background on what the overall project is. I hope it came across. I know that um, these can be a little okay. difficult. Well, thank you. This is, this is very, very incredible. And so as a result of the project, this training was created. And in a way, I see the training as very unique because it's a it's a capsule in time of of the language. Can you elaborate yes. more on that, right? So I don't know if I'm still sharing my screen or not. Are yeah, you seeing yes, the you are. You can um I think it's somewhere, but it's a great picture. Okay, so you're seeing the interpreter training program, or are you seeing uh, I'm the, seeing the, the picture of uh, your dad and your mom. Ah, okay, so let me try and... I think it's at the top, stop sharing. Okay, I'm going to no, stop sharing that, and I'm going to try and share a copy of the document. Hopefully you can see that. So um, can you yes. see interpreter training program? Yes. <laughs> okay. So this is the actual historical artifact. This was the report um, that my, my father wrote to then end the project. Um, it's a little over 100 pages. Um, if you, you know, you can see it was written for the US Public Health Service. 1964 was when he got it out. The program was running in 63. Table of contents, you can get a quick understanding and overview of what you know, what was what is in the report? It's essentially an overview of the problem, um, what the challenges were, why they needed to figure out how to overcome these language culture barriers, um, a breakdown of what each of these challenges included from the complexity of the language to the complexity of uh, the semantics to the need to know the culture of the two, both healthcare, Anglo healthcare, and Navajo concepts around wellness and illness, etc. The dynamics of power within both the native 
and the white communities and how they play out within the hospital, that's discussed in detail, um, et cetera. Uh, and then the development of the training program, the rationale, what they chose to train and how, how they evaluate it, how they tested it, um, what were the principles that they were cleaving to as they rolled this program out, um, and then how it worked, what worked, what didn't, what were the challenges, why, um, and going forward, what would you need? And then a number of really interesting appendices. I mean, so you basically have a full-blown medical interpreter training program in this document, along with the test. And it's absolutely fascinating. As somebody who's built these programs now and, you know, over the past 20 years, um, this, is, this is very similar to what we're doing today. And it's mind blowing that this was being done in the 60s. And when you actually start reading it, if you go into the very first paragraph, um, it says, this is actually building on something that was done in the 40s in the Navajo Nation. So this is not even the first time that Indian Health has tried to meet these challenges. This is just a continuation of an ongoing challenge. And, and so, yes. And, and there's another very interesting way to look at it because 1964, a pretty important year in the civil rights movement, uh, the, the has, how has the language access progress evolved? This is an interesting time capsule from the perspective of language access and uh, uh, are we still facing the same problems? Have we solved some of the problems, but just now calling them differently today? Yeah, this is why I get so excited about this stuff. And when I actually sat down and read through this for the first time, I started just jumping up and down because it's the same stuff over and over again. So basically, when one of the issues that my father identifies as to why the program, this, pro this first program in the 40s wasn't continued, is basically the attitude uh, among the, you know, the, the dominant um, society was, now those going to die as a language. The native people are going to disappear. They will cease to be. So we can't put in time and effort into these programs that won't be necessary in another 15, 20 years, right? This is something that I was hearing when these issues would come up. And you hear now when you talk about in, in indigenous language, education, uh, language services, et cetera. But I'll tell you what, as my father points out in this project, the number of Navajos is just continuing to grow. And while Navajo is, is you know, not as widely spoken among certain urban uh, populations. It's still greatly widely spoken by many members of the, the nation. And where we saw this recently was during the coronavirus because COVID hit the Navajo Nation especially hard. And they were facing all sorts of challenges, getting information out to rural households and communities with the same challenges right so to and, your point it's the same stuff over and over again and so uh looking at that uh it's just uh well can you tell me from your perspective why are we still speaking the Diné language you know it was supposed to die 15 years after 1940. Uh, why from your perspective and i can speak from my perspective but why is the native language so important to the people? I, I think language, language is essential in the maintenance of identity and kudos to the Navajo Diné people for being fully invested in maintaining their, their, maintaining themselves, just being themselves and who they are. And the language is integral to that. So, the the language is going to stay alive as these humans have stayed alive in their home, in their place. And despite the efforts of others to take that away from them, um, the language is going to continue. And my sister is uh, 
My sister married a, a, a married into Chisuki Pueblo in northern New Mexico, and she had six kids, and now I think she has 22 grandkids. They are all fully invested in in learning their language and and maintaining that and keeping their culture together, so they have a fully a fully realized understanding of how language is essential to the maintenance of a people. Um, so I just. And and so so beautifully said, so beautifully said. Language is our self identity. It's our heart. It's it's part of who we are. We interact differently in different languages. We, in a way, there's studies that show that we even uh, organize our thinking differently in different languages. So language is is core and and super important. And so to your point, uh, I believe that. Uh, the languages, as long as the people live, the languages will not disappear. Um, as long as there are, you know, uh, remaining people who, who are uh, from a particular nation or a particular group, the language will live. But um, and therefore, it's critically important to expand the language access that we have, and and to grow the language access and and. Um, the work you've been doing is critically important. But going back yeah, to I mean, this, this, this paragraph at the end of the intro just makes that point right there. You know, it's like, OK, you want to speculate on whether these languages will go extinct. Um, that's fine, but the problem is here now and you can't make decisions and policies based on a guess. And so I, I, I like to think in reading through this, there are many arguments and arguing his arguments for why these are necessary, why these types of programs are essential. Many of them are very compelling and they're still the essentially the same arguments we have today. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the this is the closing paragraph, I think, on in the intro. And he's basically making the argument to understand that the the language culture barrier is at the heart of effective healthcare. If you want to go and actually improve the health and well-being of any population, and they, you know, or the, the, this is an issue, you got to figure this out. And the interpreter is the central node. Um, so, so, and before I get into this, I mean, walking through this document, if you if you look at it, you can look at it from so many different directions. Um, he talks about the historical, you know, the conditions in that environment that were leading to the creation of this program and the need for it. Um, he gets into, and if, and I won't, I won't bore the audience by going and scrolling through and showing them all, but I'll kind of give it, you know, he gives an argument for like, why, oh, I'll just look at, I think, you know, Basically, right here, he makes the argument, all the doctors that are doing this at this time were white English speakers, Anglo-English speakers. And in order to do their work, they had to form a relationship with their patients. And to do that, you need an interpreter. Guess what? There weren't enough trained interpreters in the hospital. So who did they use? They grabbed whatever Navajo speakers were around, janitors, you know, at, at sec, you know, at anyone they could find. And what was the result? Less than adequate services, like, you know, healthcare services that were subpar. So he makes that argument, and guess what that argument is? It was the same thing we were hearing at the beginning of this millennia in a lot of hospitals all around the United States, right? That's what people did. That's why we, that was the fight for certification of the CCHI. So this is everything that's been going around. It's the same arguments. Um, so he makes the argument there. This is why it's important. This is why the interpreter is critical. Um, and then he goes into, in order to make that argument, and I don't, I'm just going to go down here real quick to get an overview. He makes the case that the languages, the problems of communication, for a lot of people that don't know about what interpreting is and maybe never studied languages, they oversimplify things. We all know this for those that work in language services. 
So he makes the argument in his report, these are all the reasons why this is such a complex process. To be an interpreter, you have to know so many things and be able to do so many things quickly. And so he breaks down the linguistic challenges, the, the semantic challenges, structural, the conceptual challenges, and he does it in relation to the Navajo language. So any students of linguistics, this is actually really interesting stuff. Navajo is one of the most challenging languages to, to, to learn. So the DLI scale, it's a five, right? It's way out there for English speakers to try to get their heads around. And he breaks down a lot of the reasons why. And he gets into language specific, semantic differences, cultural concepts around illness and health, um, and why it's essential for an understanding of things to, um, for the interpreter to do their job. So as far as like students of interpreting, I see this as pretty darn interesting because there's no other historical artifacts out there like this. And this is just kind of really cool to see. So he breaks down the language and the cultural barriers and um, how they sit there. And then I, I won't go too much farther into this. I'll only say two other things about it. If you like language, you like culture, you're interested in interpreting, there is a plethora of interesting examples of how these issues play out in the healthcare setting to, to uh, provide effective healthcare. Um, there's concrete examples. He gets into the actual training and he breaks down, this is how we built the training. We asked that we needed at least X number of white healthcare professionals to attend because they need to understand what's going on to actually work with the staff better. A whole bunch of practices that you see outlined in this document that you see outlined right now today in a lot of our current medical interpreting programs. And so this is just a cool thing. And I mean, it's 100 pages. The last thing I'm going to say is there is a very concrete, really interesting breakdown towards the end of the document, which is about a very challenging interaction, which is a request to perform an autopsy on somebody who has recently died, recently passed. And so when my dad started this program, he and Dennis started implementing this, only 3% of autopsies were performed at the major uh, hospital where these, they, were, they were doing the program. After the program was performed, they got up to 80%. So how did they go from 3% to 80% in a year? They laid out exactly how effective communication can be made and what issues had to be spoken to and in what way to achieve that understanding between both parties involved and make it acceptable. And it's quantified. So that kind of data is amazing. And he's got data tables on graduates, people that drop out of the program, people that fail. Why? There's some, there's some solid data in there. Um, and so at any rate, this is kind of what, what, what the document is. I geek out on this, I get all excited, but, oh, but that, I'll just leave it there. This is incredibly fascinating. This is a time capsule of the language and um, it would be interesting to even to see for those who are linguists, how, especially those who are speakers of Diné language, how the language has evolved. This is a time capsule of language access work and we want to see in a way we can benchmark ourselves how much have we inv involved uh, and how much progress have we made and where we've succeeded and what we still have to learn and address. This is a time capsule of culture competency training. Are we still not understanding or I still have a lot to learn on establishing that trust relationship? And we, we talk about in trauma-informed uh, care, how trust is one of the, it is the underlying key, key component. So this is an incredibly fascinating uh, project, incredibly fascinating training. I am very grateful for you sharing it with our, with our listeners. And if you were to to leave the listeners with uh, your fi final thought, final wisdom, what would be what would that be? So 
this whole effort came about for me talking to uh, somebody who's on your staff now, Elena, Elena Langan. She and I have been colleagues and friends for years now. And um, when she was uh, with the ATA, um, we had a vision of uh, hosting this PDF, making it widely available. It took me, it took me a while to get it digitalized, um, but just making it available to anyone who wants to access it, maybe using it as research. Um, I know that this, I mean, if there was somebody in a medical interpreter program, this could be the basis for any different types of research. Um, so just throwing it out there and, and inviting people to, to use it in whatever way they feel best. And then creating some kind of collaborative shared information exchange, like some kind of uh, process where people can ask questions, provide thoughts, um, give feedback on where things might go from, you know, uh, exploration they might do after the fact. And then what I always thought was it would be really exciting to kind of bring that together and present that, you know, to other people within the profession in the field, maybe at ATA, maybe at some other organization. But that that's how I always saw it. And I always thought, you know, I just wanted to get my dad's work out there because well, my dad. And, um, and then maybe just hopefully shepherd along for young, young, young people in the field to run around, see what they can make. make very good. Cool, man. Thank you so much. Very, very <laughs> grateful for that. And uh, it's uh, incredibly inspiring to hear that uh, the Dene language, uh, Navajo Nation, is uh, actually we're increasing the number of speakers, right, compared to 1869, if I remember the, the small data shown there. Be interesting to see how that progresses today, but it sounds like um, the uh, uh, language, ma language matters. So we're going to close on that. So thank you so much. I appreciate it and I appreciate your time. And um, till the next time. Absolutely. Take care.